Yeah, today I will tell you how to become a Google Shopping Ninja. Uh, no worries, there's no need for you to wear a morph suit, uh, neon green or uh, to wear a sword. I just want to show you three major fields of Google Shopping in order you have to focus on to get the maximum out of your Google Shopping campaigns. And since the time box is pretty tight, we will jump right into the presentation. Before I start with the content, uh, a short overview of what I am or the company I'm working for is doing all year long. Because when I'm sitting on the other side of the stage, for me it's always important to really know what the core competences of the guy or the company he's working for really are because it kind of validates uh, what he's going to tell me the next, next 30 or 40 minutes. Well, we die and live Google Shopping. Uh, we are really 100% focused on Google Shopping. Uh, last year in May, we uh, launched the first 100% specialized bidding tool for Google Shopping. That means we're not doing a lot of things, but the things we do, we really want to be one of the best. That means we're not always 100% right, but the things I'm going to tell you today are really based on a bunch of data which is most of the time quite a good thing. Um, I want to start the presentation which, with a pretty uh, bold statement. Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari Incorporation, once told all the best games are easy to learn and difficult to master. And this is perfectly applicable to Google Shopping because as you all know, Google Shopping is basically pretty easy to learn, pretty easy to understand, and there are not a lot of dimensions you can really work on. But at the same time, Google Shopping is pretty difficult and pretty complex if you really want to get the maximum out of your Google Shopping campaigns. Um, I want you to become a Google Ninja who is performing better than this guy, but he keeps trying. Well, um, in order to become a Google Shopping Ninja, that means really um, a guy who is really mastering his, his Google Shopping campaigns, you have to uh, basically concentrate on the following three fields. First of all, the ability of advanced campaign structuring, ultimate bidding power, and advanced analytical skills. We will start with the ability of advanced campaign structuring. Uh, in order to understand the campaign structure, we have to tackle three dimensions. But first of all, I want to start with the black box. Google Shopping for most people still is. Uh, you may believe it or not, but we are serving, servicing around 250 to 300 customers. And a lot of the customers we are taking over are still working with one campaign, one ad group, and one bid for all of your assortment. This is the worst case. A lot of people are doing it this way because it means no work, but at the same time, you really lose a lot of performance. You either lose money or you lose out on profitable revenue. This is definitely the worst case. But the question now, what is basically the, the best practice to do it? Ninja tip one is definitely never use a single product targeting for your whole assortment. I guess nobody's doing it anymore here in the room. I just wanted to make sure that I, that I uh, make this statement. But what is the actual campaign structure best practice? We start with the, with the first dimension. Basically, we can say that the clear best practice is to really have a school-based campaign structure. That means for every product that you offer your assortment, you should have at least one product target. That means whether you're doing your bid management manually or you're working with a bid management tool, that you're really able to set CPCs on product level. This is clearly the best practice. And what I want to make sure at the same time is, Make sure that you have a school-based campaign structure, not just for your top sellers, but really for your whole assortment. Why? Because your top sellers are not your main revenue drivers. I will talk about it later on. Why is it that important to have a school-based campaign structure? Well, this is a pretty common approach. A lot of campaigns we are, we are taking over um, are set up like this. That means you have ad groups and the ad groups are clustered according to your brands, categories, or any other uh, custom labels, whatever. And on that aggregation level, most of the people are setting their CPCs. That means for Nike running shoes, I set the CPC of $0.65. That means all of the product IDs within the product groups are handled the same way. This is definitely not the worst way to do it, but definitely not the best way. I'll tell you why. In this very simplified example, you can see that the return on ad spend for this ad group is 10. And your minimum uh, ROAS target is 6.7. That means the ad group is performing better than you actually want it to be. Um, that means whether you're using a tool or you're doing it manually, you won't change the bid for this product group since it's working for you. But if you would have a SKU-based campaign structure, that means you would have a target for each and every SKU of this product group or for your whole assortment, you would find out that there is one product within the product group which isn't performing at all. Namely, the left Nike running shoe in black. This product has a ROAS below one, uh, $75 cost, $50 revenue. This product is burning your money. 
but you wouldn't know it if you bid on product group level. That's the reason why it is so important to really have a skew-based campaign structure because only then you can really find out what the actual product performance is. And only if you know what the product performance actually is, you can set the right CPCs. We're not talking about the bid management right now. We are just talking about the perfect campaign structure which enables you, your team or your bid management to make the right decisions. It should look like this. There's one ad group. And below the ad group in the sub dimension, you have for each and every product that you, of your assortment, one product target. And if you have one product target for each and every SKU, you can really set CPCs based on the actual product performance. There are basically two ways to set up such a SKU-based campaign structure. The common approach is definitely um, to cluster product IDs within one ad group. That means you just think about the campaign structure you want to have. Let's say you want to cluster your uh, ad groups according to your brands. You can do it easily. The most important thing is that in the sub-dimension of the ad group, you really have to have one product group for each and every product ID. That's what I can guarantee you is the best practice how to handle it. The advantages of such a setup uh, are clear. First of all, you're way more efficient in your CPC strategies because you can really set CPCs on school level and you're not a victim of average statistics, and you're not a, a victim of the fact that bad products are supported by the good ones. You can really be highly efficient, efficient on setting the CPCs based on the actual product performance. Um, the downside obviously is clear as well. It means a bit more work for you, obviously. Because if you set up the campaign structure on SKU level, you have to make sure that it's updated regularly, especially if your assortment has a certain dynamic in it. But the way you should do it is definitely the best way because the benefits are really, really huge. Another thing uh, which is definitely beneficial for you, if you have a granular campaign structure, that means you split your ad groups according to brands or categories, you can use pretty interesting adverts, uh, ad group performance reports like GIO reports or for example, our reports. It's just another side effect which is quite positive. Tackling the second dimension. Um, since two to four weeks, as you know, you have the possibility to set modifiers for each and every device. Not just for mobile anymore, but to really set modifiers for mobile, tablet, and desktop. This is another really huge, huge thing, and you really should go for it. How to do it? There are basically two options to do it. I think uh, since two weeks, you can also uh, go directly over the Google API. Um, but there are basically two ways uh, to do it. Option one is, add only one SKU per ad, per ad group. That means you have to really set up one ad group for each and every SKU of your assortment. If you do it that way, you can really set modifiers on ad group level. That means you have a neon green poison or poison green uh, flyknit night running shoe and you say, okay, for mobile, this shoe isn't performing at all. I want to set the modifier minus 30%. Tablet, it's working extremely well. I want the modifier plus 100%. And for desktop, it's working pretty well as, uh, uh, as well. I want to set the modifier, let's say, plus 25%. What you have to do is, in order to really work with the modifiers the best way possible, is to set up one ad group for each and every SKU of your assortment. Keep in mind, there are limits because you can only have 20,000 ad groups per campaign. That means if you're an assortment with more than 20,000 products, you have to have a more or less a multi-campaign approach. That means you have to have more campaigns than one. But this is a pretty efficient way to really work with the modifiers very, very efficiently. But there's a, another way to do it. Uh, and talking about option two, you're not working with modifiers, you're actually working with bits. What you have to do for option two is basically to build three identical campaigns. That means you build one product specific campaign structure at the, as I told at the beginning and then mirror it two times. Then you have basically three campaigns. And what you can do next is to opt out two devices for each campaign. That means you have one campaign where you opt out for let's say tablet and mobile. That means this campaign is just for desktop and so forth. That means you ha don't have to work with modifier basically you just have to set bits for the certain campaign since the one campaign is just working for, let's say, desktop. The other campaign is just working for tablet and so forth. These are the two options and we can guarantee you this is a huge, huge leverage for your performance because I can guarantee you one thing, that on SKU level there are huge differences concerning the performance uh, 
uh, of uh, devices. Just have a look at it. And if you see that there are huge uh, differences, do it one way of, of, of the explained options. It's really a huge benefit. Most of our customers, we did a survey, uh, tend to prefer a three campaign approach because it's just a bit easier to handle. But it's really up to you how to do it. Nevertheless, these two options are available. You really use it because then you're really able to set CPCs according to the performance of your products concerning the different uh, device uh, performances. Tackling the third dimension, uh, using query sculpting. Uh, yesterday, there was a pretty good talk about query filtering. Who was attending it? Offline? Okay. So don't be mad at me if there is some content which you ha uh, heard already yesterday. But I think the topic is quite complex enough to really talk about it the second time. And I think I have two or three more ideas which will definitely help you to do it um, even a bit, a bit better uh, than you heard yesterday. Um, definition query sculpting, well, it's addressing shopping queries with the right bits by using several campaigns, campaign priorities and negative keywords in order to increase performance. Well, this is pretty easy. Because one thing is for sure, most of the people trust Google 100%. That's a good thing because most of, most of the time Google is doing the right things. But sometimes it's really a better way to overthink the decisions by Google. Because right now, if you have a more or less common approach, you are autopiloted by Google. You can't really decide for which search query you want to deliver a certain product. And you can definitely not say, okay, for this search query, I want a more aggressive bid than for another search query. You can't do it with a common approach. This is more or less the framework of Google Shopping, but there's a way to do it. And in order to do it, you have to understand that for each and every search query, there are certain criteria which makes you possible to more or less predict the performance of the search query. I think you have already heard some criteria yesterday. I just want to go through some of them which are very critical from our perspective. The query word count is definitely one criteria which is very, very crucial concerning the performance for a search query. Because we found out if the, the word count is one or two, the conversion rate of a search query is definitely lower compared to search queries where the word count is three or more. Another very interesting feature is the brand reference. What does that mean? If a brand is included into the search query, most of the time the conversion rate is higher compared to search queries where no brand reference can be found. Another very interesting thing is intent-based query components. What do we mean by that? Uh, if a search query contains buy, online shop, financing options, that means that a clear intent can be found. The conversion rates are again most of the time significantly higher compared to search queries where such intent-based comp query components can't be found. And product matches are very interesting things. You can work with, let's say, term document frequency weights or stuff like that. How many products fit to the search query? The more products which fit to the search query, the lower the conversion rate will be because the search query seems to be, to be more generic than product-specific one. There are tons of such criteria. I just want to give you an idea that there are criteria which enables you to really say if the search query will likely perform well or will, will perform pretty badly. And why is it that important to really try to bid on, on, on search query level? Well, even if you have a very advanced campaign structure, that means you're already bidding on school level for your whole assortment, you're still not as granular as possible. There's one Nike free 5.0 running shoe, and let's say this product of your online shop has a target ROAS of 6.7. But the actual ROAS is only two. That means your team, your bid management, or yourself will definitely reduce the bid, obviously, because the ROAS is, yeah, just sucks big time. But um, if you lower the ROAS, the following thing will happen. If you lower the ROAS for a whole SKU, you will also lower the bid for each and every search query for that SKU. And then you will have one major problem, because for each and every SKU, there will be search queries which will give you highly profitable revenue. In this case, Nike Free 5.0 and Nike Free Running Shoes, these two search queries give you highly profitable revenue with ROAS values of 12 and 6. But if you lower the, 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 the CPC for the whole SKU, you will miss out on that revenue. What can you do now? Well, the explicit approach of query sculpting or query filtering was already explained yesterday. The explicit approach is a bit static one. It's already highly advanced, but it's not the best way to do it. Let's put it this way. The explicit approach is based on the idea that you find patterns in your search queries, 
which tell you, well, the product-specific search queries perform well, the brand reference search queries perform medium, and the very generic ones aren't performing at all. If you know such patterns, you can basically set up a campaign structure like this. You need three campaigns, one for the product-specific search queries, one for the brand reference search queries, and one for the generic ones. This is the first thing you do. You have to build three identical campaigns. Then set the right priorities. I think you have already talked about it yesterday. Nevertheless, I think it's complex enough to talk about it again. You have to set the right priorities. What you want to do is, for the others campaign, that means for the campaign which is very generic, you want the highest priority. For the uh, brand referenced uh, search queries campaign, you want the medium uh, priority. And for the product specific one, you want the lowest priority. And then you have to set the right negative keywords. Because what you want to do is, you say, okay, uh, the generic search queries aren't performing well, obviously. That's the reason why I want to funnel them in one uh, campaign. The buy Nightman running shoes, the brand reference search queries, you want to funnel in the brand campaign, and the product-specific ones you want to funnel in the product-specific campaign. And in order to funnel them, you have to set, obviously, the right negative keyword lists. What you want to do for the others campaign, you want to exclude all search queries with, with product terms and all search queries with queries with brand terms. And for the brand reference uh, campaign, you want to exclude all product terms, and the product uh, com specific campaign, you exclude nothing. And based on that, you can set different CPC strategies. Obviously, for the generic ones, you want to set low CPCs because you assume that they're not performing uh, uh, at all. And let's say for the product specific uh, search query campaign, you want very high CPCs because you assume that they are performing well. A very sh a short example, a simple example. Someone is uh, searching for Nike Free 5.0. The first campaign which is hit because it has the highest priority is the others campaign. Well, this campaign is not eligible to serve because you excluded all product terms like Nike Free 5.0. So the next campaign is hit, the brand referenced one, but again, this campaign is not eligible to serve because you excluded Free 5.0. So the search query is funneled into the product specific campaign which is eligible to serve because there are no negative keywords and the bid is very high because you assume the customer want, knows what he actually wants and that the conversion rate of the search query will be pretty high. This is a quite static approach. Uh, the advantages are definitely, well, you can more or less really start to bid on query, query level, which enables you to really get some leverage on your performance, but there are some downsides. And the biggest downside is, first of all, the patterns are very heterogeneous. That means if you really state for your whole query assortment, more or less, that generic search queries aren't performing at all, you will lose out on hidden champions. Because I can guarantee you one thing, there will be generic search queries in your shopping accounts which give you profitable revenue. If you do it that way, you exclude them and you bid them all the way down to, let's say, 10, 15 cents, whatever your CPC strategy uh, will be. That's the downside. But there's another way to do it. And we call it implicit query scouting. What do we mean by that? The implicit query scouting approach is not about um, patterns. That means we don't care if a search query has two words, uh, the search query has a brand in it, or whatever. We don't care. We really just care about the score we give the search query or you give the search query. Because it can easily be that such uh, generic search queries give you highly profitable revenue. And with the Implicit approach, it's really about the score you give a search query. That means you have criteria uh, based on you score your search queries. But you don't really care if it's a generic one or a product specific one. You really care just about the score. And if the score is high, that means that the search query will perform good. If the, uh, the, the score is low, obviously the search query won't perform at all. And there is more or less a medium bucket for search queries where you can't really say from the beginning on if the performance will be okay or not. Which criteria we are talking about? Color reference could be one criteria which is very, very crucial concerning the performance of a search query. Term documents frequency weight, a classic SEO criteria. How many products fit to the search query? As I said at the beginning, the more products which fit to a search query, the more generic the search query is, and most of the time the search query won't perform at all. Brand reference. Obviously, you can have a look at performance metrics, term length. Another very interesting thing is, especially for some verticals like sports, electronics, or fashion, if there are numbers can be found in the search query, the conversion rates are significantly higher compared to search queries where no numbers in it. Why? 
because someone already knows, okay, I want the Nike uh, Hyper Venom EX SK90, let, let's say in size 43, yeah, stuff like that. You just have to dig down into your search query and try to find out which criteria really have, a, have, a, have an impact on your performance. And how could such a scoring should, could look like? Well, let's say we have four criteria we are focusing on because we assume that these four criteria are the ones who really define the performance of the search query. And we have two queries, running shoes and buy Nike men's running shoes black. Well, one uh, criteria is word count. Another is uh, the brand reference. If brand reference can be found, it gets a value of two. If not, it gets a value of zero. Uh, if color reference, if it's true, it gets a value of three. If not, it gets a value of zero and a normalized conversion rate, a classic performance metric. Let's score these two terms. Well, the word count for running shoes is two. It gets the value of two. There's no brand reference in it. That's the reason why it gets a value of zero. It has no color reference in it. That's the reason why it gets zero. And the normalized conversion rate of this uh, uh, search query is 0 0.32. That means the term score is 2.32. Well, let's score by Nike men's running shoes black. The word count is six. There's a brand reference with Nike. That's the reason why it gets a value of two. There's a color referent, reference. That's the reason why it gets three. And the normalized conversion rate is 9.60. And the score for this search query is 20.60. This is a high score. That means we assume that it's performing extremely well. That's the reason why we want to push it. And the running shoes gets a low score. That's the reason why we assume that the performance won't be good at all. And that's a pretty dynamic thing, because one thing uh, you can make sure with that approach. If you, let's say, score your search queries on a weekly basis, it can easily be that this search query is in one week in the high-performing bucket list, but for whatever reason, let's say the normalized conversion rate breaks down, in another week, it's in the low-performing bucket list. This is very, very important, because with a static approach, with an explicit approach, you are just static. You state all the time that the generic search queries won't perform at all. With that approach, you can make sure that you really get the CPCs right based on the actual score you give the search queries. Um, and how to do it? It's pretty similar to the approach, uh, uh, to the explicit approach. You again just need three campaigns, set the right priorities, and set the negative keyword lists. Whereas the negative keyword lists are not about brand terms, product terms, it's just about is the, is the search query in the high-performing bucket? Does, has it a high performance, uh, a high value in your term scoring? Or does it have a low uh, term scoring? And that's how to do it. It's pretty dynamic, it's pretty advanced, but it will give you huge, huge leverage for your uh, shopping campaigns. At least try to do it for your top sellers. Well, ultimate bidding power. Uh, what is the time box? You got 23. Okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> any questions so far? Or we can talk about it later on anyway. <laughs> um, the ultimate bidding power. Um, we can talk about bidding for the next three hours, won't be any problem. I just wanted to, uh, just wanted to make sure to, to really focus on the most important things from our perspective. The reason why bidding for Google Shopping is such a big challenge is because of the long tail problem. What do we mean by that? We are servicing, one of our customers is the biggest PLA account of Europe. They are spending millions of euro, millions of thousands of euros on a monthly basis. But even the biggest PLA account of Europe doesn't have a lot of top sellers. This is classic and typical of Google Shopping. Your top sellers are there, but you don't have a lot of them. The classic PLA product is a so-called long tail product. We're talking about products with only one, two, or zero conversions. This is the major problem. You have very, very few statistical data on SKU level because most of the products have only one, two, or zero conversions. A typical timeline, conversion timeline, of such a long tail product could look like this. You have clicks on a daily basis. For a long time, you have no conversion. Then there's one conversion. And then for another long time period, there's no conversion again. And it's pretty hard to get this bidding right for such products because you have no statistical basis and at the same time, you know that the best practice for your campaign structure should be a SKU-based campaign structure. That means you re really should set your CPCs on SKU level. But at the same time, you have a problem of, of the lack of statistical data. Why is it that important to really focus on such long-tail problems? 
This is a statistic out of 150 accounts uh, through 20 different verticals. And what you can see here is obviously two axes. The y-axis is uh, revenue and the x-axis is the products of these accounts, whereas they are clustered according to their conversion on a monthly basis. That means that uh, these are all products with one conversion on a monthly basis out of the 150 accounts, products with two conversions, three, four, five, and so forth. And what you can see here is that the top sellers, which get you 10, 11, 12, 9 conversion on a monthly basis, they are there in your shopping account, but they are not responsible for the, for the biggest chunk of your revenue. The biggest men revenue drivers for your shopping campaigns are products with only one, two, or three conversions. We have accounts where up to 80%, up to 80% of the revenue is generated by products with only one conversion. That means the revenue is spread all over your assortment. And at the same time, that means you have a lot of products with only one, two, three, seven, ten clicks and only one, two, or zero conversions. And this makes it so tough, whether you do it manually or with a bidding tool. It doesn't matter. It's just really a tough task. And I want to give you, we can skip that slide. It's pretty unromantic anyway. Uh, but I want to give you a, a just a, a short overview, a, a short idea how you could solve the problem. And there's one analogy. Um, I think uh, the rent index in London is quite a hot topic, I guess. Um, and what I want to tell you right now is that this analogy could be the key for the long tail problem concerning your bid strategy. If you look at the rent index of London, Obviously, every rental objective has a certain amount of features. That's pretty clear. There could be a parking place included, there's a balcony with a certain square meter, there's a garden included, the kitchen is already implied, you have furniture already in it, you have a certain number of rooms, and so forth. And what's pretty clear is that every one of these features correlate with the height of the rent, obviously. If you rent a flat with 10 rooms, the rent will be a bit higher than compared to a, to a room with only two rooms. And now the important thing is, if you would know all the features which correlate with the height of the rent, and you would know how they correlate, you could basically predict the rent for each and every rental objective in London just based on the features of the rent. You wouldn't, you, there's no need for knowing the rent, you just look at the flat, the flat has this, 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 this feature, and based on the features, because you know how they correlate with the, with the rent, you could make a pretty valid prediction what the rent will be like. And this is applicable to Google Shopping, because Google Shopping has a very, very special precondition. In contra contrary to uh, classic Google Tech Stack campaigns, for each and every click, conversion revenue, at the end of the funnel, there's not a keyword, but there is one specific product with a certain set of features. And these features can help you a lot on getting the right CPC. And I want to tell you with a very, very simplified example. We're doing it on a, a machine learn basis, but it's just about the idea. Don't get me wrong if it's too easy for you, but it's really just about the idea. You have one product, the Nike Flyknit Racer Brave Blue Poison Green. The, uh, this shoe has one conversion and two clicks. So the conversion rate is 50%, right? Well, it won't be 50% all the time. Um, I assume, maybe I'm wrong, but it won't be definitely 50% all the time. The question now is, you have only one conversion and two clicks. If you try to make a prediction based on classic e-commerce metrics, you will fail big time because the corridors of your prediction will be way too huge. There's way too, too big of a room to, to make failures. Now it's about the idea, look at the features of the product and look how they correlate with the conversion rate. As I explained with the analogy of the rent index. So, there are tons of features for your products. Just uh, have a look at some of them. Look at products with the same product age and look at their conversion rate. The conversion rate is 5.12. Look at products of the same category and look at their correlation with the conversion rate. The cor conversion rate is 1.35. Uh, look at products with the same brand performance and their conversion rate. Look at the products with the same price range and their product performance. There's a huge secret sauce, I can tell you right away but there are a lot of features you can have a look at. Look at the products with, of the same product line and so forth. And what you will find out is that based on these correlations of features, you will get a pretty valid prediction that the conversion rate for this shoe won't be 50%, but 3.54. That's what it's all about. And this is really doable. Uh, whether you do it manually or with a bidding tool, it's just about the idea. Don't focus on classic e-commerce metrics because for Google Shopping, if you want to bid on school level, 
you, you are set up to fail because the statistical basis is just not there. Look at your features because the features will tell you the true value of a product. Well, uh, I have five minutes or what is it? Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, I will jump into the next advanced analytical skills. Custom labels for advanced insights. Everybody knows custom labels, obviously. Um, custom labels are well known, but most of the time, at least from our perspective, they are not used up to their full potential. Most of the time, custom labels are just used for clustering, obviously. So you set a custom label for season, selling rate, clearance, or whatever. And you try to cluster the products based on the custom levels. But custom labels can do a lot more. There's one certain thing, and I don't know if you, if you knew it or you're already using it that way. But custom labels are pretty mighty because custom labels are recorded at the time of the impression. That means if you have a custom label and there is a value in the custom label, at the time of the impression, every click, conversion, revenue, and so forth is, is attached to the value of the custom label. And this opens up a lot of possibilities. And I want to show you one of them. The reason why it is all recorded and attached at the time of the impression gives you some possibilities to really try to validate crucial hypotheses, which are, from your perspective, very, very important for your uh, shopping account success. For instance, we have a very, very huge customer in Germany which is uh, selling running shoes. And uh, they are using our bidding tool. And uh, we are working with 100 criteria, but uh, the customer told us there's one criteria we are not using. He assumed that if one shoe has only two sizes on stock, he assumed that the conversion rate will be way lower compared to a shoe where all sizes are in stock. Well, that's quite obvious. But the question is, is it really valid? Well, you can find it out by using custom labels. So the hypo hypothesis is, if you do not have enough different sizes of a particular pair of running shoes on stock, your conversion rate is dwindling. Well, that's the hypothesis. And we tried to find it out with using the custom labels. What the customer did is, he integrated the custom label uh, into the data feed, uh, and it was called inventory score. And he delivered on a daily basis a score for the custom label uh, inventory score. That means if the score is 10, all the sizes for the pair of shoes are available. And let's say if the score is only two, there is only sparse inventory. And now, again, since all the metrics are attached to the value which is in the custom label field at the time of the impression, you can really find out if the inventory score correlates with the conversion rate. And what we found out is this. This is an aggregation level of the whole account. And what you can see here now is, is, is a very, very interesting fact. All the products were at the time of the impression had a custom label value of 10. That means all the sizes were available. The conversion rate was 7.38. For products where the custom label value was only 3, that means only sparse inventory was available, the conversion rate was only 1.97. For products with a value of only 2, the conversion rate was only 0.64. This is huge, guys. If you could really do your bidding based on such interesting hypotheses, which can be totally different for, for, for any use case you really are, are active in, but you can really make huge, huge leverages on your bidding strategies. Because if we know that a shoe has a value of 10, obviously you want to make a, a different bid because you assume that the conversion rate will be way higher compared to a, let's say, inventory uh, uh, score of only two or three. This can be huge. Another very interesting thing is you can also insert custom labels for your prices. I talked about uh, Rani, our head of product development, who's sitting right there. Uh, some of our customers are inserting custom labels uh, for price tags. That means the price is included into the custom label. And we can really find out if a change in the price whether it's up or down, does it really have an effect on the conversion rate? So the use cases are, yeah, you, you can set up whatever you want. The interesting thing is use custom labels, not just for clustering, but really to, for finding out if there's some, some hypothesis you already thought about for a long time, if they're really valid and crucial for your, for your shopping success. 
Well, um, guys, I think that's it. I'm in the time box. I'm, I'm happy. It doesn't have me a lot of uh, a lot of times. So, guys, um, the presentation will be available anyway. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I wish you have a, a great day. Thank you very much.